Hi, I'm Bill Arnold. Thank you for listening to this podcast. There are many more podcasts available at MyFaithRadio.com. Your support makes this possible. Thank you. And a warm welcome. It's the afternoon show. I'm Than Bennett in for Bill Arnold today. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, you know, I, you and I live in a a beautiful world. It's a beautiful world that's been fashioned by our God and our creator has surrounded us with beauty and he's surrounded us with majesty and he has invited us to be caretakers of it. That's one of our primary responsibilities here on earth. But within that beauty of creation, we, you and I, all all of mankind, we have been sort of fashioning our own world. Now, as as followers of Jesus, you and I are our contributions to that fashioning. They they should mirror the beauty of our creator and they should fall within the confines of his perfect design for us and for the world. But I think that all of us, if we are honest about it, we would recognize that so much of that world, so much of that world that we are fashioning with our own hands falls outside of God's perfect design for us. And I actually wrote about this just a little bit in my newsletter this week called The Equipped. And and the result of that uh, fashioning outside the design of God is something that Romans 8.22 calls the earth groaning. It is straining, and in many ways, it is actually breaking. And 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 yet, you and I, as followers of Jesus, as as image bear, bearers who were intentionally and lovingly designed by the Creator, we have an opportunity to live from wholeness, and we've got an opportunity to offer that wholeness that comes from being purposefully designed by our Creator to those around us. And my guest this hour is going to help us with that. She is Rosaria Butterfield, and she has written a new book. It's called Five, uh, Five Lies of Our Anti-Christian Age. And I'll introduce Rosaria to you in just a moment here. I'm, I, I'm really so grateful that she's making this contribution into this space because I know it's it's a difficult one for, for many of us. And so I just want to invite you. I want to invite you into the to enter into this conversation, but I want you to do it with a soft heart. I want to ask you to to open up your heart and open up your hands with for the the, the purpose of I'm going to say re- receiving new tools uh, so that we can live out of authentic truth truth with a capital T and and I want to invite you to accept those tools so that you can help others do the same thing so let me introduce you to Rosaria and we will get her on the air uh, Rosaria Butterfield is an author she's a speaker. She's a homeschool mother, and she is also a former tenured professor of English and women's studies at Syracuse University. She has written a memoir called The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert. That memoir details her difficult journey to Christ. You'll probably hear a little bit from her on that. But most relevant to today's conversation, she is the author of a new book. As I mentioned, it's called Five Lies Five Lies of Our Anti-Christian Age. So we're going to be discussing primarily that book today. So Rosaria, I am so glad that you have joined us. Welcome to the afternoon show. Oh, thank you so much, Stan. It is my privilege and pleasure to be here with you and all of our listeners. Well, we are so grateful that you would spend a few moments of your time today to share this this work and this really, I think, this investment into uh, this space. I am grateful for your voice in this space as I've I've sat with the, the resource today. You've got a you've got a depth of knowledge. You've got a depth of experience that's built on. Uh, a few things built on your study of God's word. It's also built on a, a personal journey of finding your identity in Christ. So uh, as we start the conversation, if you would just just set the table for us a little bit, uh, mm-hmm. share what you would about your personal journey, about how God drew you to his side, and then ultimately how all of that you know leads to the place where you write a book like this. Right. Yeah, right, right, right. And I appreciate that because that story of God's amazing grace in my life explains why I needed 
to write this book. Um, so I am currently a pastor's wife, and I have been biblically married for almost as long as I've been a Christian, which is a lovely thing. That is really a, a story of God's grace in my life. And I we have four children, and I have a grandson. And if you just kind of look at me from the outside in, you might be really faked out and think I'm pretty cleaned up. But um, the reality is um, it's only the Lord Jesus Christ that cleans anybody up. And I certainly know that dearly. When I um, first started exploring the Christian faith, I was not exploring it because of some authentic draw towards it. I was a lesbian. I was an activist. I was a professor. I had written, co-written the, the first domestic policy partnership uh, law at our university, which was a forerunner to gay marriage. And I was testifying before the legislature um, my job was to make homosexuality look wholesome, and I, I'm afraid I pulled it off. And uh, what I wanted to do was basically understand why Christians, Bible-believing Christians, would not leave consenting adults alone. That was the phrase you heard a lot from the gay rights movement you know, 30 years ago. I'll bet you haven't heard that expression in a long hmm. time, and, and that says something. And so... In the process of wanting to write this book, I met someone that, quite frankly, I thought he would just turn out to be my unpaid research assistant. He was an evangelical pastor, and he was my neighbor, and he cared about my soul. And I thought, well, that's fine, because I care about my book, so maybe the two of us can be can work this out. <laughs> um, um, his name is Ken Smith, and um, he became, to me, um, the father that I never had. Um he wanted me to read the Bible, and I wanted the re to read the Bible because I needed to understand it to write this book. And in the course of two years, I met with Ken and his, his amazing wife, Floyd, every week for a dinner at their house, two years. And um, we poured over the scriptures. They insisted that I read, and I read well. I was an English professor, so I was kind of, kind of tickled by all this reading business that these people cared about. I thought these might be the last people on planet Earth who care about reading as much as I do, you know. And um, but you know, I read through the Bible seven times in two years, and under the loving care of a pastor who kept saying to me, "But what about your soul?" But have you thought about the fact that there's a holy holy God who wants to be known by you? Um, and and in the process, I came to discover something that was a little shocking, uh, you know, not least of all to me. And that's that I truly believed that Jesus Christ was a risen and resurrected Lord and that that would be true whether I believed it or not. It was just a true truth. But the other thing, and I, the other thing I believed is that the gospel was good news but just not for people like me. Hmm. And so that became the next struggle for me. How as a lesbian could the gospel be good news for me? Like I understood how it could be maybe good news for you and everybody else. And that became um, another journey. Um, and that's the journey that I recount in The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert. What it meant for me to, to learn that gay was not who I was, but how I felt. And hmm. what it meant to believe that the Bible's witness about my homosexuality, that it was found in the flesh, forbidden in the law, and overcome in the Savior. And did I believe it? And did I trust the Lord with my life? Did I believe that God could move mountains but couldn't change my feelings? I mean, what 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 was I doing? And so Ken and Floyd and the church walked me through all of that. And I ended up committing my life to Jesus. I ended up... Um, and, you know, I should say that at that moment, it's not like the, it, no point in this journey did God just kind of flip a switch and I was lobotomized and I hmm. no longer had body memories and no longer had temptations. I mean, that's just that's just not real life. Real life is sin bleeds patterns into the way you think and the way you feel. And the gospel promises come with tools, but those tools hmm. must be you know, we have to use them pretty ruthlessly, and that can be very, very hard. And so what I say about my conversion was I lost everything but the dog. It's not totally true because I didn't lose my job at Syracuse. But what I did was I gained um, the affections of a man who would become my husband. 
And I went from, um, you know, being a tenured professor to being a church planter's wife. And with the rigors of all of the losses and the gains that go into the gospel um, and into my gospel life, I have come to a place, and that's the place where I wrote this book, to realize something really horrific. And that's that even though God has forgiven me, um, the world we live in, the world that has where LGBTQ plus is no longer just um, a set of feelings that a set of people might have or something like that. It's become the reigning idol of our day. And my fingerprints are all over it. And so I wrote the book in part because moms and grandmas like myself, I'm an older woman, um, would come to my church or stop me at Costco or come to my house and say, um, why can't we major on the majors anymore? If Christ is not divided, why is the church? And so I sat down and I came up with three reasons that have produced five lies. And then in great horror, I saw that my fingerprints were all over these lies. So a lot of the book is um, my own repentance, not only the repentance of the sin I committed as an unbeliever, but also the way that I carried over some very sinful ideas into my life as a believer and then wrote those into books. And so it's a very personal book for me. Um, and I hope that it's a book that other people can learn from my mistakes. Rosaria, I am uh, I'm very, very grateful for your willingness to be vulnerable, to share that background with us. I think it informs the conversation that we're going to have in the subsequent segments. Um, and as you were, you were talking, I, a couple of things stood out. Number one, you said that only the Lord Jesus Christ can clean anyone up. And that is so true. As we approach this issue, I want us all to approach it from the from the standpoint of we've all fallen short of the standard. These are some threats that exist in our age, but all of us have fallen, uh, have succumbed to some threat that the evil one would have for us. So let's approach it with a sense of humility as we listen to Rosario's story. And I want to ask one more follow-up question with it, with an observation before we dig into the content of the book. I, You were talking, I'm so grateful that you now uh, know and you live from the truth, but I'm also just struck by the reality that you also know the lies that sound yeah. so much like truth when you yeah. are in them. One of the one of the things that I constantly am uh, actually communicating to God. I did it right before we came on air here. I tell Him that uh, God, I'm here, I'm yours, and I'm listening. And I, I want to communicate that just to to outwardly um, acknowledge that I belong to God, and that's true for you now. But Rosario, maybe just say a, a, a word or two about those. Um, you you know what it means to for a lie to sound like the truth, don't you? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And and I would say we all do because yeah. even the you know the the you know the, even the first lie in the garden did God really say? You know, I think I think lies don't come at us with sledgehammers. They they come more softly, and often they come with just enough truth in them. Hmm. That we just, it's like, you know, like finding a dollar bill on the ground and you pick it up and you're kind of looking at it from all different perspectives. Like, did it fall out of my pocket? Is it real? And so a lot of these, um, a lot of the lies that I talk about in the book started out, they, they, they bridge to the church through half lies. And the biggest of those lies is a general idea that somehow we human beings are more merciful than God, and that we have to either soften God's truth or we have to conceal even God's truth. Um, it it it's um, it's a funny thing because there's of course nobody wants to be a jerk. I don't want to be mm -hmm. a jerk. I don't want you to be a jerk. You know, nobody wants to be um, um, to be publicly humiliated. Um, but the truth is uh, the. The Bible, we are to every day do exactly what you said, Than. And then also, as you're reading your Bible, you turn the pages of the Bible over against the pages of your heart. Hmm. Because every day we are, you know, we are very susceptible to this false, some false teaching that has crept into the church. But the other problem is just what I said. The false teaching is in the church now. My concern in the five lies that we'll talk about are not so much that the world promotes or believes them, 
but that the church wasn't able or willing or wasn't something. I'm not even sure what the right word is, but it just didn't um, stand in a place of truth. And and by by allowing false teachers into the church who sound good, you know, they sound compassionate and they they offer things that um, that 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 we all want. You know, we want to stay connected with our loved ones who are living in sin. That's a good thing to want. Um, but these are false teachers and this is false teaching and they 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 are exchanging a true gospel for a kind of half gospel. And so we need to be not only um, faithful and in our private life, but we need to be discerning about the ideas that are swirling around us, especially as um, we have those great opportunities that the internet has provided. Um, in some ways, it you know, you and I could listen. To, we could have listened to 500 sermons today if we weren't taking care of our chickens. We talked about that beforehand. <laughs> um, but it also comes with a lot of garbage, yep. and it's all kind of mixed in there. So yeah. we need to be discerning. We need to be courageous. And and this might sound kind of harsh, but I do. I wake up every morning and I say, Lord, may all the people I'm going to disappoint today be disappointed for your glory. Hmm. We need to stop being people pleasers. We, we need to remember that the, the fear of man is a snare, but the fear of God is safe. Hmm. And that includes the fear of man includes the fear of our unbelieving children who are currently threatening to blackmail us if we don't believe that, um, you know, transgenderism is real or something. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yes, I, I do try very much in this book to help my readers be sanctified in the truth, um, to know enough of the conversation out there so that you can, you can hear a lie and discern a lie when you hear one. But ultimately, your job is to know the truth, not to know mm -hmm. the lies. And so you you can be sa somewhat sanctified, if that makes any sense, in the yep. ignorance around us. I mean, right now there are, what, 78 gender pronouns. And by the time you and I get off this show, there will probably be a thousand. It would be ridiculous for us to spend all of our time trying to learn that. We need to know the good. Amen. Rosario, I'm grateful for your heart on that. I love that you said we've got to lay the pages of Scripture over the pages of our heart. Amen and amen to that. We're going to take a little break, pick the conversation up on the other side. I do want to ask you about the threat of technology later in the, the conversation, but we'll walk our way through these five lies that our anti-Christian age has told us and continue to hear from my guest. She is Rosaria Butterfield. Her book is Five Lies of Our Anti-Christian Age, and we will be back with more conversation right after this. You? Well, you're loved. I get it. It might not always feel like that. But the truth is, God knows you and where you are at all times. He actually loves you so much, he calls you his. If you would like to discover, maybe even rediscover that relationship with him, consider attending the Set Apart Conference for Women on March 8th and 9th. Go to setapartconference.com and register today. It's the afternoon show. I'm Fan Bennett in for Bill Arnold, having a great conversation with my guest, Rosaria Butterfield, who's written the new book, Five Lies of Our Anti-Christian Age. Before the break, she was encouraging us to lay the pages of Scripture over the pages of our heart and to stand on truth. Rosaria, I want to jump right back into the content. You've spelled out five lies in this book that you want us to be yes. aware of. Um, I want to I want to kind of unpack them, uh, starting with this. In, in the introduction of the book, you say uh, we all live in Babel now, and I think I think that's an apt description because we are we are inundated with untruth. We talked about that at the beginning, and I, I would say we're probably even in, inundated with hostility to the truth. Oh yes, and so. There is a greater need than ever for us to know truth, to stand on truth personally, and to share that truth with others. But, you know, right. if we're going to do that effectively, and you alluded to this a moment ago, but we've got to be very aware of the pitfalls around us. And so right. this book is about some of those pitfalls. And I, I know you wrote it 
primarily for Christian women, but I want you to talk yes. about some of the, the the main ways that God's plan for both men and women is being threatened by our age. Right, right. Well, the five lies, all five of the lies have to do with ways that the the rebellion against the created order, the idea that ma- God made man and woman in his image, um, the ways that that is uh, either denied or denounced or just not really valued. And in some ways, you know, people have spent a good bit of time talking about the dangers of something like critical race theory. That's a very, that is a dangerous idea. It's not, it's not a, it's not a Christian idea. That would be a little bit like having a broken leg, but when you attack the created order, that's like having a fatal heart attack. So this is quite serious. Um, We are made in the image of God distinctly as men, and as women and, and and that that ontological sex is both ontological and eternal you will be male or female in heaven or in hell and in the new jerusalem and um so so yeah so so living in babel is just a way of saying it's like the it's like we can't talk to each other anymore um the 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 most basic things about human life nature are disputed what what should we do from from there? And so the book is a I hope a helpful guide about what to do when even within your own family you can't agree on the most basic thing like male is male and female is female. Yeah, and I think we all have experiences with that. And when we have those experiences with people we love, you mentioned inside a family, certainly inside friend groups. I think it's, I think it's very easy to fall back on it just being, a, you know, a conflict of opinions. Well, you have your truth, I have my truth. But we, as Jesus followers, want to stand on the truth, cap, capital That's right. T, right? And so, That's right. what are what are some of those truths from Scripture, whether they be you know biblical terms or biblical concepts? What what are the truths that you want people who read this book to be standing on, um, but but those truths are being challenged by the world. What are what are a few of those? Right, right. Well, one is that being made in the image of God means that you are made in, in fact, the knowledge, the righteousness, and the holiness of God. Now, every human being born is made in the image of God, but that image has been marred by the fall of Adam, which was imputed onto us, and therefore. We are susceptible to uh, deny God's image, to deny God's knowledge, righteousness, and holiness for worldly ideas. So if someone comes to you and says, well, hey, you know, I'm, I'm made in the image of God as a lesbian. No, that's just not true because being a lesbian or being transgender is indeed from the, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Now, in God's great mercy, you can be forgiven and and given victory over that sin to live in the order that God wants, but you can't actually be made in God's image in sin. That doesn't work. So that would be one of them. Would you like me to give another or should we? You, should let, I let you ask let, some more questions? Well, let me actually <laughs> follow up on that because I actually sure. – that, that is the one actually that jumped out to me from the, the opening portions of the book, being made in God's image. It's why I, I started with the lead in, just, just a reminder of, of verbally stating that I belong to God. I think it puts us in a posture yes. that associates us with uh, the Absolutely. character of God. Now, your book points out a, a, a lot of threats, but I think it keeps coming back to – uh, that ideal. And I think um, if we right. think about the image of God it has to be blameless and flawless, right? I feel right. like that is the proper frame for us to begin all of these conversations is expressing that image of God that we see in those around us. Is that is that kind that's, of the idea here? Yeah, that's absolutely right. But it also means that when you are blackmailed, and you will be, you will be blackmailed if you have a daughter who thinks she's a son and wants you to go to a wedding. I mean, you know what, you know, this, these stories are everywhere. Um, You know, I'm not going to, if you don't do what I want, I won't talk to you ever again. Well, I, I think we have to be willing in those moments to not be blackmailed, to realize that, um, that we have someone we love dearly. Maybe it's even someone we brought into this world and the last thing we want to do is do anything that might help send that person even further into damnation and hell and God's judgment. So we have to be in some ways willing 
to be the grown up, to be the parent, and to continue to parent our um, prodigal children, even though they're older, um, through this difficult journey. And it means very clearly um, not doing anything that might affirm their sin, but doing a whole lot that affirms your love for them as a human being, as a person. Um, so one of the things that happened in 2015 is uh, the Supreme Court uh, weighed in on uh, uh, Obergefell versus Hodges. That was a Supreme Court case that legalized gay marriage in all 50 states. It also introduced something called the Dignitary Harm Clause that changed the legal definition of harm from material to um, to fairly emotional. Now it means that you are harming someone if you fail to affirm their LGBTQ plus dignity. But quite frankly, if you're a Christian, you must fail to affirm any dignity that stands in opposition to Christ and to what it means to be an image bearer. So you you know that that that's just the reality. And I think one of the things that parents and and caregivers and just everybody needs to know, we need to know what time it is. We need to know what reality is. Reality is all of those three exchanges in Romans 1, the exchange of truth for a lie, the exchange of heterosexuality for homosexuality, and the exchange of the worship of the creator for the worship of the creature, every single one of those is now codified in some kind of law in the United States. That That's something that we need to wake up to, and um, we need to have a courageous love for our loved ones. And I believe, and in the the back of the book is actually an appendix, just a, a fact appendix about what to do if you're invited to a gay wedding, what to do if you um, are asked, you know, this or that, and to make some distinctions. And so I think our job is to try to do everything we can to stay connected without becoming indoctrinated or without affirming that which might send our loved one to hell. The stakes are very high and I really know it. And the importance of what you're saying, Rosaria, is especially true in a system of self-governance like our own, where uh, we are the ones that should be uh, leading the way for public policy. We're going to take a, a short break and come uh, back and continue our conversation. My guest is Rosaria Butterfield. She's written the book, Five Lies of Our Anti-Christian Age. We'll pick it up on the other side of the break. But when we come back, Rosaria, I want to ask you uh, another question about, you mentioned emotions and feelings, and that's a, something you you focus on a lot in this book. How do we balance an emotion or a feeling that we might have against what we know to be biblical truth? So I'll ask you about that on the other side. I'm Than Bennett in for Bill Arnold. My guest is Rosaria Butterfield, and we'll be back with more right after this. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That's Psalm 139, 14. I love that so much because the very purpose that we were made for was to praise our God, and he designed us intentionally uh, for that purpose. So he designed us per- perfectly to fulfill that purpose. My guest uh, today on the afternoon show, I'm Than Bennett sitting in for Bill Arnold, my guest, is Rosaria Butterfield. She's written the book, Five Lies of Our Anti-Christian Age, and she's helping us combat some of the lies that will come against that truth in our current age. Rosaria, I want to just read out the five lies here. You've been weaving them into our conversation, and I appreciate that. But uh, just so people get a context of of the book that we're talking about, lie number one, homosexuality is normal. Lie number two, being a spiritual person is kinder than being a a biblical Christian. Lie number three, feminism is good for the world and the church. Lie number four, transgenderism is normal. And lie number five, modesty is an outdated burden that serves male dominance and holds women back. I want to ask uh, some questions around each of those. But first, let's come back to this idea of emotions and feelings that you touched on a moment ago. Oh, um, This world, this one that humans are fashioning, it makes us feel things that question truth. And we talked about this a little bit, but especially true when it's someone we love. When they live in a way that rejects God's design, we still love that person. We still want to be in strong relationship with that person. But sometimes our feelings and our emotions then 
outweigh truth. So what would you say to the person that's struggling with that feelings and emotion on one side and truth on the other? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think first of all, be, be, make sure that your feelings and emotions are grounded in truth. So feelings and emotions are wonderful things, but not if they're rooted in something else. And so we are downstream, obviously of the 19th century, the 19th century produced this idea that sexual orientation is a true category of personhood that being gay or trans is a state of being. It's who you are. That is not biblically true. So the first thing you have to do is reject the false ideas about what it means to be human that the world offers. The other is to reject some of the teaching that the world is giving you. I'm thinking about something now like the like Biden's anti-bullying policy that is in every um, government school in the United States. And it defines being a bully as being someone who is not an ally to an LGBTQ plus person. Now let let that wrap, you know, wrap your mind around that for a minute. Obviously, if you have a Muslim student walk into a classroom, that person is should be respected and regarded and appreciated and 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 treated kindly. But nobody would expect the whole class to say Allah is God and God is Allah. And yet if a person walks into a classroom wrapped in a rainbow flag with the ter- with the word Imago Dei superimposed on it, in order to supposedly not be a bully, you have to affirm that person. Now, think about what that does in the minds of people. And so we have to reject some of this thinking. And the way that that Joe Rigney puts it, and I think it's extremely helpful, is to realize that we live in a world that has said everything, every problem that you have is solved by empathy. And that's just not true. Empathy means standing in someone's shoes. Sometimes empathy is a very good thing, like if you're at a funeral or something. But look, if I'm drowning in the river, Than, don't stand in my shoes, Mm -hmm. okay? Stand on solid ground Mm -hmm. and throw me a rope. And that's what the gospel does. And so so one of the things that Christians need to be ready to do is to have an adversarial relationship with the things the world values and to think about how you're going to do that um, and and why you're going to do that. But it's no longer comfortable. The way Aaron Wren puts it is this is this is negative world. And, and what he means by that is this is a world where being a Bible-believing Christian is perceived in negative terms. And that's really not true. So you have to be willing, though, to know that and to stand in a faith that says, I'm going to honor God and God is going to protect me. You know, I'm going to honor God and God is going to, um, you know, hear my prayers for my children, Uh, but I'm not going to try to get around the truth of God and do it my own way because I I can't, it won't work anyway. Rosario, let me ask you this. We've actually got a a question coming in from a listener Mm. and I want to, I want to kind of springboard off of that into uh, a thought that I had. I wanted to get your feedback. The Carol texts in, how is the sin of homosexuality any different than gossip or similar accepted Great sins? Great question, I wanna, Carol. Uh, yeah. I wanna, can I, I, I answer that? Of, you certainly can. Let me, let me add okay. just a little bit of context to it because I think what it feeds into is um, this question about, well, it, it, is one sin greater than the other? And there's a right. couple things I wanted to ask you about within that. Certainly yeah, yeah. we've all sinned well, and fallen short, right? So we absolutely. need to approach this from humility. Absolutely. But here's, here's the right. broader so, question I hope you'll you'll address in this. Sexual purity, right? This is a whole biblical concept that has lots of deviation from it, right? And I think we I think we stand on firmer ground if we approach any deviation from uh, sexual purity with that same call back to God's perfect design for us. So speak to okay. speak to those components, okay. if you would. Let, let me answer Carol's question first, though, because it's just a really straightforward question. And I wrote this book for the moms who ask that question. The sin of homosexuality, first of all, all sin is is uh, damnable, right? Um, the way that the the West uh, Missner Confession of Faith puts it is that is this, as there is no sin so small, but it deserves damnation, so there is no sin so great that it can bring damnation upon those who truly repent. So repentance is key, and he and and you're absolutely right. Sin is the great democratizing principle. But the sin of homosexuality, and I say this as someone who lived as a homosexual, is different because it's a sin not only against practice, that is 
an activity and a desire, but it's also a sin against pattern, the pattern of the creation ordinance. And what that means is if you have a, a son who's living with his girlfriend, that's a terrible sin. And, you know, let's say they get married and you're like, well, okay, you know, it's still a terrible sin. But then they both come to Christ, praise be to God, they don't have to get divorced. But if you had a son who decided to live with a, a male partner and engage in what is truly a fake marriage, it's not a real marriage, but nonetheless, upon his coming to faith, which of course we also uh, celebrate, he would have to separate entirely. And so so it's so homosexuality is a sin against pattern and practice. And back to Than's question about biblical purity, um, one of the reasons we want to keep that in the forefront of our mind is we we um we we tend not to then ask questions like, did God really say and kind of hedge our bets at the edge of sin, but we desire for the sweet perfection of the gospel. We desire to live as holy vessels of the Lord Jesus Christ, which we can do even after a history of homosexuality, because God is true to his word and he saves sinners just like me. So one of the things that I have needed to do in my life repeatedly, Rosario, is make uh, pre-decisions. I've had to pre-decide yeah, right. that I am going to live by the truth of God's word, right. even when it sort of rubs me the wrong way, right? Because my my human condition, and I'll just be candid about this, my human condition causes me to read biblical truth, to understand biblical truth, and for sometimes it feels like it still doesn't jive with the way that I feel. We talked about feelings a moment ago, but for me, I have just had to decide, to decide in advance, I am going to live by the truth of God's word, even when it doesn't feel right. Makes so right. May, maybe say a word to that person that biblical truth doesn't doesn't feel right to them. How do they right. decide to stand on it anyway? Right. Absolutely. Well, first of all, I would say that before, and I love that pre-decision that you talk about. That's a great way of saying it. I think it becomes, for me at least, I don't know what, what you do, but for me, it became a question of, do I actually trust Jesus? Hmm. And so, um, I don't remember who said it, but, you know, every time you, for every one time you look at yourself, look at Jesus 10,000 times. So do you trust Jesus? Do you trust that he knows what's good for you? But I completely understand. I literally felt like I was throwing myself, you know, over a cliff when I committed my life to Jesus and decided I was going to, you know, break up with my girlfriend. And then, and then of course we know this, it, you know, sin isn't just about like what you do. I mean, the, the the Tenth Commandment says, thou shalt not covet your neighbor's wife. It doesn't say thou shalt not take your neighbor's wife, right? So, so, you know, sin is in our heart. And so we have to battle with that every day. But I would say it is a matter of, do I trust Jesus? And, and trust becomes a question of, do I know Jesus? And um, that means that you are deeply in the word. And I think we've lost the affection for that. Um, we have become quick readers or just Bible listeners. But I mean, I remember early in my Christian life, you know, Pastor Ken Smith saying things like, well, you know, you should sit down and, and read all four of the Gospels and then come up with a list of da, 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 da. And, you know, I think today, if you told somebody to sit down and read four, you know, four books of the Bible, they might say, what? You know, that that could take me hours. Yes, it could. And it's very well spent hours. Yeah, and at least for me, I, I agree with you. There's something about sitting with the pages of scripture that really yes. embeds it into my soul. So I, I love that. Yes. Uh, Rosario, we're gonna we're gonna take a quick break. We'll pick the conversation up on the other side. But uh, I had Carmen LeBurge on with me from uh, the morning show, Mornings with Carmen, mm -hmm. earlier in the week, and she said something that stuck with me, and it, and it echoed in my mind as you were responding there. She said, "Than, when I came to Jesus, all of me died." Yes. A relationship with exactly. Jesus Christ means accepting all of him, all of his yes. truth. We Amen. will grow over a lifetime to know him more, to know his character more, and to be more like him. It will never be yes. perfect this side of heaven. However, 
A walk with Jesus Christ means that all of us dies and we take on all of him and we pursue his truth and his character. And I'm so grateful for the way that this resource can help us do that. Again, I am Than Bennett. I'm sitting in for Bill today and my guest is Rosaria Butterfield. Her book is Five Lies of Our Anti-Christian Age. And when we come back from the break, I want to ask you about advice for uh, young girls, young women. I have, my wife and I have two daughters, 13 and 11. Let's think about them over the break. Think about what advice in this area you would give to them. We'll be back with more right after this. Hi, this is Bill Arnold. You might be the kind of person that goes to Paris and still listens to Faith Radio on the app. Or you might be more like the person that goes into the next room in your apartment and listens. The good news is, is using the app is just as easy in both places. Downloading the free app is crazy easy. Just text the word app to 877-933-2484 and click the link. And if you happen to be in Paris, there is a really nice little coffee shop not far from the Eiffel Tower that serves a really nice chocolate biscotti. I'm Than Bennett, in for Bill Arnold today, having a great conversation with Rosaria Butterfield, written a new book about five lies our current age is telling us. Rosaria, I want to jump right back in. We've got about uh, 10 more minutes together, and I want to ask you very practically as a, as a parent. My wife and I are uh, parents. Uh, we have three children. Two of them are girls, 13 and 11. And uh, my wife, Brooke, models so well for them what biblical identity looks like. I think about uh, you know, strength with humility, right? And and service, but uh, with, with confidence. And I, I, I would like you to speak to to young girls and also to parents of young girls and adolescent girls. What it, what advice would you give to them as they are following Jesus and dealing with these inputs from our age? How would you how would you counsel them and encourage them to steward these issues with confidence? Right, right. Well, the first thing you want to know is what the inputs. Uh, where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. So I spend a lot of time um, trying to help parents who have had, uh, especially girls in government schools who need to make uh, an exit plan because of the particular way that the Biden administration's anti-bullying legislation has led to a kind of transing of their teenage daughters. Now that might sound kind of like crazy if you don't if you haven't like spent any time thinking about what's going on in your local government school but it's a pretty serious thing and for for many many young girls many most girls are quite given to empathy so if you tell them that they need to be an ally to someone to not be a bully they will not have any critical tools to distinguish the lies from the truth so the first is is to really walk closely with your daughter so you know what those burdens are, what the burdens of her heart really, really are. Um, you know, and the other are just things that you already know that you'd want to have family devotions every night and you want to keep a nice open window for your children to talk to you about what's going on in their life and, and their heart and what their, you know, fears are and their concerns. But you also have to realize that a world that is growing in its homosexuality, transgenderism, and singleness. The most recent Gallup poll says 30% of young people believe they are gay or trans. Now, that is judgment. A world that grows in transgenderism, homosexuality, and singleness is not a world being blessed right now by God. And so you're going to have to really help your daughter see the power and the beauty of biblical womanhood. And that sounds very old fashioned and it is, and that's okay. Yeah. And I think, I think I probably speak for parents uh, all across the, all across the country, all across the world, anyone listening that these conversations are more difficult because of technology. You alluded to this earlier, all of the inputs, the internet, social media, uh, quite honestly, whether you're whether you're a child, whether you're an ad- adolescent, adult, we have 
we have instant access to things that hurt us, things that are toxic to us. Right. Right. And so I I know you are writing primarily to women. And I will just say as, as the man in this conversation, this, this threat is very real for men as well. It's extremely high. It requires true accountability. I mean, real accountability, Mm -hmm. close proximity to Jesus followers who will ask you uh, the tough questions. But if you would just say a, a word about that digital threat and what your advice would be to to parents and and to kids for right. uh, combating it. Right. Well, the the digital threat to girls is is a little bit different. So the digital threat for men as you know is is a kind of fall into pornography that is really deep and powerful and I I'm not minimizing that. I'm but I am talking to women in this book and the and the digital threat to girls is that they hate themselves. That they they look at themselves for the wrong reasons, in the wrong way. Again, we're to look at ourselves through the pages of scripture. And the Lord um, the Lord says that he loves us and he's going to take care of us and that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. He also says that we're to repent of our sin and that repentance is uh, is unto life. It is a good and glorious thing. So, so I think you, you don't want to uh, minimize that. And then you don't want to miss the important connection here. Um, Transgenderism is on the rise, especially for teenage girls. And the medical analog to transgenderism is anorexia, which, you know, decades ago was on the rise for girls. So these are these are forms of self-harm. But the difference is the times in which we live. Um, you know, 30 years ago, when all of the you know gymnastics teams at the high school were bulimic or anorexic together, I'm not saying all of them, but you know what I mean. Nobody thought that that was a good thing. Nobody said, let's give these girls a sticker in a parade and affirm their fatness. That was ridiculous. And yet today, that's exactly what we do. Girls come in, they want testosterone, they want a double mastectomy, a hysterectomy, they're minors. And you were, we're told if you don't affirm them, you're, you're, they're going to kill themselves. And and again, if you think I'm overreacting, please go take a listen to uh, Brandon Showalter's excellent podcast, uh, Generation Indoctrination, over at the, the Christian Post, um, because it's serious and these numbers are growing. And even if your daughter isn't affected by that, I can guarantee you there's somebody in her life who is, and she needs your help to just see her way through this maze of self-hurt and destruction and self-harm. So good. Rosario, we've only got a, a few minutes left here. I want to ask a final question on that point, actually. We um, are may be tempted to affirm. We may be tempted to just accept. And I think if we land on the powerful truth that our creator designed us intentionally, he designed us for a purpose. He designed us the way we are uh, with a purpose in mind. That That is the affirmation. That is the acceptance that we should be after. And and I think the most loving thing that we can do is communicate that truth to those around it, who us who are are grappling with it. So maybe just say a final word to that person out there yeah. that, that has a question about this. They have value in the way they right. were designed. And I and I would tweak your question your your comment just a little bit. I do, I believe that you should accept people where they are, even if they're in a really, mm-hmm. really difficult place. You can accept someone without approving them. And so I think that would be very helpful, especially for the daughter who comes home and says, my name is Joe, or, you know, you need to actually deal with the situation in front of you. But what you also need to do is remember that you actually know this person maybe better than, 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 than they know themselves. You are after all the mother or the father. And so you want to make sure that you have retained all of the baby pictures, all of the clothes, all of the things that they want you to get rid of, because that's part of the delusion of transgenderism is that you can reinvent yourself. It's a funny thing. It works on an old feminist distinction between sex and gender, but it just completely denies biological sex altogether. And it's leaving a legacy of harm. It's the kind of harm that the church needs to be ready for. And here's what we need to remember. Jesus throws no one away and Christians don't either. When I go to school board meetings and I meet a man 
who castrated, who allowed his 14-year-old son to be castrated all in the name of this new world order. Here's what I know. These people need the gospel more than anybody because in the gospel, there is hope for an eternity that says that you, young man, will be the man you were meant to be in the new Jerusalem should you commit your life to Jesus. You can't mock God. And the church needs to be ready to receive detransitioners and respect them and give them dignity um, and honor their repentance um, and, and show them the love of Christ. And so I would not start out sparring with your loved one about her sense of reality. I would accept it, but not affirm it. Mm. And that can be a fine line. A very good book to read on this is Laura Perry Perry's book, From Transgender to Transformed. It chronicles the story about her, how her Christian parents stayed with her, but didn't affirm her transgenderism. And then Christopher Yuan's book, Out of a Far Country, how his parents stayed connected, um, but did not affirm. It's hard, and we know that. And therefore, you need a lot of people praying for you. So be in a good church, a faithful church, a church that wants you to be courageous and strong and does not think you've done anything wrong. Hmm. This is not your fault. This is God's providence. And you know what? If it is, if there's some sin you've committed, then repent of it. And then you get the same you say the same gospel promise that everyone does. Psalm one hundred Amen and amen. Rosario, we are out of time. The book is Five Lies of Our Anti Christian Age. We are so grateful that you have been with us. I hope you'll pick up a copy of the book. Next hour we have Jerry Jenkins joining us. Thank you, Rosario, for your time. And we'll be back with hour two after this. Thanks for listening. Programming like this is made available through your support. Information available at myfaithradio.com.